In corporate America, there's something that's called the rat race. Everybody's trying to get their share. Everybody's trying to get their piece of the pie. Uh, some shares are larger than others. It's a rat race in corporate America. Everybody's trying to get to the top. Everybody's trying to climb that corporate ladder and to uh, be successful and be the best. And in corporate America, oftentimes there are many people that want to be the GOAT, the greatest of all time, the top of the ladder, the best of the best, and all that recognition. And I'm not saying whether that's good or bad in corporate America. I'm not saying those ambitions are bad or not. But how do they correspond to the kingdom of heaven? Is there a rat race in the kingdom of heaven? Uh, is there a corporate ladder where people are caught climbing the corporate ladder, pulling people down, trying to get to the top? Is there a greatest of all time preacher, usher, singer, and all those type of things? Let's find out in today's lesson what Jesus has to say about being the goat in the kingdom of heaven. Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. John W. Wilson III, bringing you the Sunday School lesson uh, for Sunday, March the 12th. I want to thank you for joining me on today. It's always a pleasure to have you with me. So let's get right into our lesson. Our lesson deals with the greatest in the kingdom. That's the title. It comes from Matthew chapter 18. We're looking at the first nine verses, verses one through nine. The, who's the greatest in the kingdom of God. So, let's, uh, before we get started, I want to uh, ask for your help. If this lesson is beneficial in any type of way, if you think it may benefit somebody else, please hit the like, share, and subscribe button. Um, I'd like to reach as many people as I can, and of course, I need your help. So thank you so much in advance. Thank you for joining me on today. So, let's get right into it as we get to chapter 18 of Matthew. A little background as Jesus is well into his ministry. He's uh, gone over the halfway point in his ministry. He is popular. He has his 12 disciples. He's healing. He's teaching. He's doing all these things. And the disciples are seeing that this man is great. This man indeed is the king, is the Messiah, is the, that's to come. They don't understand the whole big picture, but they see all that he's done, and they see how special he is, how awesome he is, things that are being done that no one else can do, and they recognize him as the Messiah, as the king that has been promised. And so they're um, knowing that he's, king, that he's a king, and then knowing that a king has a kingdom, they are wondering where they fit in into his kingdom. That's what's going on here. Uh, if you look at Luke chapter 9, this is a, uh, also covered in Luke chapter 9, 946. Uh, they are, Jesus has just told them about his impending suffering. And they are so caught up in him, the, being the king, the Messiah, being great, they see that he can do all these things. They can't even imagine or comprehend uh, the words that are Jesus saying that he must suffer and be crucified and be ro ro rise on the and must rise on the third day. They can't comprehend that. And somehow they go from that conversation of Jesus talks about his impending death that he must leave them. They talk about who the greatest is. And in Matthew, we have them coming out of the uh, temple and uh, talking about who the greatest is. But I can imagine that uh, over the period of Jesus' ministry and being around them, they know who he is, at least to their ability and ability to understand, and they're jockeying for who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom. They know that every kingdom has a 
a right-hand person. The United States has a vice president. It has senators. It has House of Representatives. It has appointees. And they want to know where they're going to fit into his kingdom and who will be the greatest. And they, can, they figure that since they are his chosen 12, the greatest has to come. Uh, out of there and when they say greatest they're talking about who's going to be the most valuable who's going to be the maybe the greatest of all time who's going to be the most blessed who's going to be the most successful who's going to be the most esteemed by God who are you going to like the best they're doing all these worldly things remember I talked about an introduction about the corporate America that represents the world in a sense and do we bring what's in the world into the kingdom of God, into ministry? And we're going to find out that Jesus says emphatically, we do not. So they are wondering where they're going to fit in. They're wondering amongst the 12, who, who's going to be the best, who's going to be the highest esteem, who's going to be recognized, who's going to be the forever leader, who's going to be the greatest uh, disciple of, of all time. And so Jesus is going to um, answer this question for them. And you know, Anything about Jesus, anything about the kingdom of God, uh, usually what is in corporate America or in the world, uh, it is the opposite in the kingdom of God. In the corporate America or in the world, whoever can scratch to the top, whoever can get there by any means necessary, that's how you do it. But in God's kingdom, it just does not work that way. You don't get there by any means necessary. You get there only by the grace and mercy of God, and you have a position uh, in God's kingdom that is given to you, as appointed to you by God. And so one thing I want to say is this, is that whatever position that God has given you, it is just as important as a position that God has given somebody else. I used to believe before I became a minister that I said, boy, these ministers, the position that they have, the responsibility that they have, they're going to, they're going to have the greatest reward or the greatest position in the kingdom of God. And I've come to learn that that's not true. I think the way it works is that whatever God has given you, whether it's ushering, whether it's singing in the choir, whether it's hospitality, whether it's being a deacon, whether it's being in leadership, being a ministry leader, being an evangelist, or on your job, being a mom or dad, whatever God has called you to do, you do that to the best of your ability. And when you do it to the best of your ability, then that's just as important as a minister or somebody else doing their job to the best of the ability. So wherever you find yourself, be the best, do the best to your ability. It's not a competition at all. You're not competing against somebody. One thing I also learned about life, there's enough of God's blessings to go around. There's enough of God's rewards for everybody. They never exhaust. They never exhaust. So don't get caught up in this rat race in, in the kingdom of God. Don't get caught up in, I got to be the best preacher. I got to be the top of the line preacher. I got to be the best black preacher. I got to be the best evangelist. I got to be the best. No, it doesn't work. You be who God has called you to be. Be that best. And that best is surely good enough. Okay? Surely good enough. So that's my little rat and raven. Let's get into this. It says at, in verse 1, chapter 18, at that time, I mean, at that hour, at that moment, at that time frame, the disciples came to Jesus saying, remember, they're, they're thinking about things. They're thinking how great Jesus is and how they're going to fit in, saying, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who's the goat? Who's going to be? And they're not talking about uh, in the past. They're really talking about the amongst the 12. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? And so they want to know. They're looking at each other. They're comparing each other. Uh, Peter may think it's him because Peter's the spokesperson of the 12 disciples. He's the one in the Bible that commands the most attention. He's the one that uh, retrieves a coin out the fish and gives it to Jesus to pay taxes. He's the one that's been rebuked by Jesus. He's the one that Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Uh, he's the one that's walked on water. So maybe in his mind or maybe in the other side of the mind, they think he's the greatest. But, but on the other hand, as much as Jesus, Peter was lifted up, he's been, he's been corrected or, or rebuked in many different ways too. And so the other disciples, they may feel that they are going to be the, they're going to be the greatest of all time. But anyway, there's some kind of competition going on. It's unholy, it's unrighteous, it's not of God. And this question here 
lets us know or, or gives evidence that they don't truly understand the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, there's not going to be the greatest. Uh, the, 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 if you want to have the greatest, it's going to be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But as monks... Uh, the everyone else, there will not be a greatest. There will be people who have rewards and positions, but there will, need, will not be a greatest of all time. That's a worldly thing, and the disciples are taking something from the world in their culture and applying it to or bringing it into the kingdom of heaven, and Jesus has to correct that. What you think, how you make it in the, in the world, is not how you make it in the kingdom of God. How you become the greatest in the world is not how you become the greatest in the kingdom of God. What it means to be the greatest in the kingdom in the world does not is not what it means to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Understand those things, okay? So uh, it says here, and to him a child, and calling to him a child, Jesus, and calling to him a child, he put in the midst of them. And said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. If you go back to Luke chapter 9, 46, uh, you, you will tell you that Jesus, when they asked that question, he knew what was in their heart. And he knew what was in their heart was not right. So here we have Jesus taking a child, a young child. So not only are the disciples around talking with him, but there are other people around with him also. So the audience may be pin, pin pointed toward the disciples, but there's a, even a, a greater audience, a greater number of people there that's present also. So he called him a child. He put it in the midst of them, okay? And he said, truly, it means, I mean, this is important. He's trying to make a point. Listen, I say to you, unless you turn, that means change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so what is he saying here? You must turn and become like children. Does it mean that they have to be reborn some kind of way, physically, and become like a child? Does it mean that they have to become an immature and naive like a child? Uh, what is exactly does it, does it mean? Well, one of the attributes of a, of a or the qualities of a child and here Jesus is not saying you become literally a child but there's a certain quality that a child has um, that is favorable that is beneficial or reflects the kingdom of heaven a child although he may be uh, he may sin he may uh, cry he may be uh, temper tantrum he may be arrogant may be defiant we're not talking about those qualities there, but the qualities that we have as a child. A child is dependent upon his parents, dependent upon adults for their provision, their daily needs, and their protection. A child is submissive, not naturally, to an adult. They trust and depend on an adult to meet their needs and provide protection perfect protection for them and that's what he's saying to them you must turn and become like a child remember in the world or the rat race or this quest to become greatest you're depending upon yourself you're doing everything you know how to do to get to the top and what Jesus says instead of doing that you must become like a child who is totally depending are totally trusting God for everything, for my provision, for my protection, for my guidance. And he, he, he humbles himself to that adult. And so Jesus said here, you must humble yourself to God the Father and not be overconfident in your abilities and be selfish in your abilities. So you must turn, change, repent, become like children. Okay? Not literally, but in that aspect, become like children who's totally dependent upon adult. You must be totally dependent upon God himself. He says, unless you do that, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. People who are not trusting God 
for their salvation, for their life, for their daily needs, will not enter into the kingdom of God. And, and what Jesus is give, doing, he's giving them a warning. If you go down this path, and to the people who are listening, if you go down this path of self-reliance, taking matters into your hands, trying to get to the top in your hands, having this worldly view of being the greatest and taking pride in what you do, or taking pride in your accomplishments, or allowing pride and arrogance to propel you to the top, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. In order, he says, the way you are to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you must become like a child. You must have humility. You must humble yourself, realizing that you're totally dependent upon God himself for everything. For everything. Okay? So, that, that's what he says right there. And it's very important. Very important. It says, look what it says in verse 4. Whoever humbles himself. See? The word humble is attached to that to the to the word children to the to the idea of children children humble themselves uh, my my children my five boys as they're growing up they knew who their providers were who their protection was and so they naturally humbled themselves to me my wife my wife and I now they weren't perfect children they didn't I'm saying they didn't they disobeyed they did all the things that most children do but there was a sense about them knowing uh, who their protector was, who their provider was, who is going to buy their, who's going to put food on the table, who's going to put clothes on their back, who's going to give them shelter, who's going to meet their daily needs, and they humble themselves. So whoever humbles themselves, like this child, okay, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so when it, this child, we're going to find out this child is likened to a disciple. Okay, so when you're a disciple, you are like this child who has humbled himself to God the Father. So whoever humbles himself like this child, okay, if a disciple humbles himself like a child is humbles himself to an adult, then that child or that disciple is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It's not about be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It's not about being a, a, a going through this rat race. It's not about trying to climb to the top. It's not trying to outdo somebody else or out-preach somebody else or out-teach somebody else. It's not about that. In the, in, in the kingdom of heaven, everybody can be great. How do you be great? You humble yourself to God the Father. You humble yourself like a child. You are obedient. You are uh, gracious. You understand mercy. You understand his grace. You understand that he will supply all your needs. Okay? So whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. How of an awkward term. They were saying who's going to be the greatest among them comparing themselves to one another. And what Jesus says, don't compare yourself. Don't get caught up in that comparison issue. You be obedient to God the Father. You humble yourself to him. And you will be the greatest. So everybody can be great in the kingdom of God. It's enough room for all types of greatness. So let's look at five. Okay. All right. So whoever receives such a child. So if a disciple, a person that we're talking about, a person who, disciple who presents himself as a child in a sense of humility, receives such a, such a child. Okay. You receive another child. Another disciple in my name receives me. Okay? Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. What is he saying here? Those who, who, who are humble must practice humility. Uh, those who are humble must receive those who are also humble. Those who are disciples must also receive those who are disciples. Okay? Uh, you're just not being humble and not receiving somebody. You have to be a benefit to other people, namely here, the other disciples, okay? All right? We must practice humility to others. That's what Jesus is saying here. You must practice humility, practice serving others, practice helping other people out, doing what's in the best interest of other people. He says right here, but whoever causes one of these little ones, these little ones, He's saying he has his child in front of him, but he's talking about disciples, okay? One, it's whoever causes 
these little ones, disciple, to believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. This is a warning about those who claim to be disciples causing other people who are disciples to sin. In other words, we are Christians and Christians should not be living a lifestyle or doing things that causes other Christians to sin. That's what he's saying here. Whoever, but whoever calls one of these little ones, okay, who believe in me as a follower of him, a disciple, a Christian, to sin, that means that uh, I, uh, I'm a Christian, I, and I call myself a Christian, and if we're if we're, we're going to go on and see that if you're really causing other Christians to sin, then the fact is you may not be a Christian at all. But let's say this: if you are say you're a Christian, and you're causing other people to sin, then you are in terrible trouble. How do Christians uh, who claim to be Christians? How do people who claim to be Christians call other people cause other people to be sin? Well, you can introduce them to gambling. And next thing you know, they're hooked on gambling. You can introduce them to pornography. Next thing you know, they're hooked on pornography. You can hook them on, you can introduce them to drugs. You can do it that way. You can be a, a pastor or a preacher or a teacher in the church and you can espouse uh, bad theology. You can promote homosexuality. You can promote same-sex marriage. You can promote adultery. You can do all these things, but... If you are, if you claim to be a Christian and you're causing other people to sin, other believers to sin, you are in serious trouble. Bad theology, lifestyle, bad counseling, uh, your lifestyle is influencing theirs in a negative way. Maybe it's a, a, a vulgar mouth or maybe it's uh, unethical issues. Maybe it's greed. Maybe it's desire for money. Maybe it's this or that, but if you're causing them to sin, you're in trouble. Look what the what he says, what Jesus says right here. He said, it would be better, okay? The punishment is so bad, so internal, uh, so everlasting, it would be better for that person to have a great millstone. A millstone was two round stones placed on a bar, put around a donkey's neck. And the donkey walked around in circles and trampled grain so it could be eaten. It was a heavy burden. Look what it says. It would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck as it does a donkey. And look, in addition to that, be drowned in the endless depth of the sea, at the bottom of the sea. That would be better punishment than the punishment that a person has who leads a Christian, a disciple, down the wrong path. Maybe it's a Christian, uh, in a, a person who claims to be a Christian in a position who abuses that position and, and really messes up the life of that young Christian. Maybe it's the, maybe sexual molestation. Maybe it's sexual abuse. Maybe it's touching in inappropriate ways. It could be a lot of things, but to those who take Christians, abuse your position, lead them down the wrong path, it is eternal misery for you, eternal damnation for you. So we who are disciples of Christ, we have a responsibility to receive Christians, build them up, and lead them down the right path. We must practice humility, doing what's in their best interest for the kingdom of God. Okay, Let's look at verse 7. Okay, And this is connected to that. It says, woe to the world for temptations to sin. Okay, what, We do live in a world full of temptations. The world has things that in it that will tempt us to sin. But the good news is that we don't have to give in to those. No, can we live a sinless night life? No, but we don't have to have a lifestyle of, of giving in to these temptations that the world offers. 
It said it was necessary that temptations come. Okay? Meaning that since the fall, since Adam and Eve sinned, sin came into this world. We cannot escape sin. We cannot. But for the Christian, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. We have Jesus who died for our sins. We have God, who, the Father, who's rich in grace and mercy, gives us stability to not fall into the temptations as a way of lifestyle. Okay? We're still struggling with that old nature. We're still going to sin. We're going to have bad thoughts. We're going to have bad actions. We're not always going to do the right thing. But that will not characterize our lifestyle in a way that we are leading other people other believers particularly, to sin. Okay? Okay? So, it says, right, it is necessary that temptations come because of the fallen world that we live in. We cannot eradicate sin in this world until Christ comes. But we don't have to participate in it. Look at what it says here. It says, for it is necessary that temptations come. But whoa, another warning, another call of judgment. But woe to the one by whom temptation comes. Have pity on the one who is, a, who is spreading, who is a spreader of these temptations. Woe to the one who has a lifestyle of tempting others to sin. Woe. Punishment is coming your way. And every time I hear that, I think of preachers around the pulpit who are leading others astray, who are leading others who come for the truth, and they're leading them away with their false, false doctrine and unethical behaviors. I see that. Now, woe to that person, okay, who the temptation comes. Woe to that person who is taking advantage of other Christians. He says, and look what he says right here. This is how you deal with it. This is a hyperbole, hyperbole. This is not a literal thing to do. But this is how much we need to resist sin and do what it takes not to be a spreader of sin that leads other people down the wrong path. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Throw it away. Wherever it's in your life, no matter how valuable or important it is, to you, no matter how much you think you need it, if it's your money, if it's your house, if it's your car, if it's an attitude, whatever it may be, guess what? Get rid of it. If that house is building up pride, sell that house, get a smaller one. If that car is building up pride, sell the car, get a modest car. If that money is causing you to sin and do all kinds of things, give it all away. Be broke. Because it's better to be broke than have this type of sin in your life where it controls you. Okay? And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than it is with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. It's better if money's your issue. It's better for you to enter into the kingdom of heaven broke, penniless, than enter into the kingdom of heaven or die with all this money and, enter, and be thrown into the lake of eternal fire. Look at your life and look and see if there's anything that has a grip on you. Is there anything that's causing you to sin? If women are causing you to sin, the, you know, don't go to the bars. Don't go to the clubs. Read your Bible more. Do whatever it takes to eradicate that sin in your life. If gambling is one, don't go to the casinos. Don't hang around people who gamble. Don't, be, don't play cards. Don't play whatever you play to gamble with. Get that part out of your life. Eradicate it out of your life. If it's anger, get help. Whatever help you can get to eradicate that anger out of your life, do what it takes. If you have to commit yourself to a rehabilitation place to get rid of drugs or to deal with your anger, to deal with mental illness, wherever it is, do what it takes. Take drastic measures 
to get sin out of your life because it'd be better for you to it's better for you to enter into the kingdom of heaven without those things because if you try to enter the kingdom of heaven with those things you will not enter but you'll be thrown into the lake of fire or eternal death okay all right let's see what else it says it says it is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the lake of fire. This is a whoa, whoa, that's a warning. Judgment coming. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. Now this is not, does that mean a little hand, a little foot, a little eye? But if you got wondering eyes, then you need to do something about that. Whatever you need to do to, do to eradicate your wondering eyes, do it, okay? Uh, Whatever it is, if you need to lock yourself in the house most of the time, then that's what you do. If you need not to have a TV in your house, you take the TV out. If the TV is causing you to watch shows that you should not watch or watch things on TV that you should not watch or you see things on TV and they're triggering something in your mind, you need to get rid of the TV. If the music that you're listening to is entertaining thoughts in your mind that are unholy, either change the type of music you listen to or stop listening to that mu music, period. Only listen to the things of God. If you're hanging around people that are cussing all the time, stop hanging around people that are cussing. If you're watching things that are comics and, are, and the language that they use, and that's causing you to cuss or breaking you down a little bit, stop listening to that individual or those comics. Those comedians. We have to, Jesus is calling for radical action so that we won't be tempted to sin. And, and you can't deal with sin in a modest way, in a soft way. You know, if you want sin out of your life, out of your lifestyle, you have to go full force and take whatever measures it needs to be. I remember Joseph. When the Potiphar's wife was trying to seduce him, he took drastic measures. He flee. He didn't stay there and say, let's talk about it or let's have a discussion about it. He got the heck out of there. and Because he, he knew if I got the heck out of there, I would not sin. But if I stayed and entertained the thought, I'm not sure what would have happened. And that's what we got to do. Examine yourselves. Know yourselves. Find out what's, where, where your weakness is, where your sin, the problem is in your life, and take drastic measures to get rid of it. If it's pride, pray for humility. If it's arrogance, pray for humility. Okay? All right. I think I went on my rant a lot for that. All right. Okay? Uh, it says, for it is better to enter life with one eye than two eyes been thrown into the hell of fire. Okay, as Christians, what I think what's the big picture? The big picture is, as this Christian, as disciples of God, we cannot entice or have anything in our lives that will entice or lead another Christian to do wrong. And because of that, we have to take drastic measures to get sin out of our life. Will we ever get it out? No. But we can have it where it does not control us, where it's not a lifestyle. And so as Christians, we have a tremendous responsibility to other Christians. We are to be a blessing to other Christians. Whoever receives one such child, one such disciple, one such Christian in my name receives me. Man, we have to make sure we receive them the right way. And we can't receive them the right way if there's sin that is dominating our lifestyle. That is so apparent that the person is going to look at, well, he says he's a Christian, or she says she's a Christian, and if that person does it, it must be okay. We cannot have that be, be said about us. As Daniel was blameless, as Joseph was blameless, we need to be blameless. When they look at us and they they see no fault in us. Not that we're perfect. They can look at us 
and they see no fault. They can't attack us with a point of sin in our lifestyle. And Jesus said, if you can do that, be, a, uh, uh, be that type of Christian, that type of disciple that doesn't entice others to do wrong, then you will be the greatest in the kingdom of God. And there's enough room for everybody to be great in the kingdom of God. In fact, God expects everybody to be great in his kingdom. Just don't base your greatness on comparing what you do and what somebody else has or what position you have and what position that other person do, does not have. Whatever God position that God has given you, be great at it and you'll be great in heaven. Your calling on your life is just as important as the calling that, the calling that someone else has on their life. Don't let anybody tell you. Well, I hope this lesson has been beneficial to you. I've enjoyed it. Uh, this is a good passage. Uh, I think oftentimes it's misquoted. Uh, I think I've been guilty of it too. Um, it, we maybe thought that it deals with a literal child. No, it deals with childlike characteristics. But although Jesus loves children, this talks about there's an aspect of being a child that we need to have in the kingdom of heaven. And that's strictly humility. Well, I love you much. God bless you. I hope you have a great Sunday.